Hey everybody, it's Carol Freeman. We're back again with another episode of Keto Chat. And I'm Carol Freeman, your host, your teacher, your guide on this tour. Uh, I'm the creator of the eight week keto diet program. And I'm here today with PJ Glassy. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks, yeah. it's great to be here. Well, will you introduce yourself? Yeah. Who, who are you? You've got this cool shirt on. and Yeah, so I own the X Gyms, Eastside and Alki. Seattle area. Yep. And uh, we do a very unique and specific kind of training. Okay. And it's a training that I invented. Okay. So the training takes 21 minutes per workout. Okay. And it's just twice a week. Wow. So it's really for the busy people out there okay. that don't have time for traditional training or CrossFit or whatever that might be that might take a lot of time. Okay. And so huge time saver. It's also really safe. Okay. So the methods are designed for controlled motions with light weights or body weight. Okay. So it's really safe and long time under tension. So continuous contraction of two, three minutes. All right. And at the end of that, complete muscle fatigue. So the two or three minutes leading up to the muscle fatigue is endurance training. And then the muscle fatigue at the end is strength training. Oh, so, so people are getting both out of it. All right. Yeah. Sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, okay. So this is pretty awesome. You've got your own workout style or mm -hmm. format or what do you call it? A, a plan, style. program? Okay. Methodology. Method. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that begs the question then, yeah. how did you get to this point? Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, let's start with, because um, I'm sure the story of owning your own gyms is one part, but also I want to know what's your, your background? How did you come to invent right. this uh, training method? Yeah. Well, it's really comes from the science and studying the science. Okay. And I learned how to study the science in college when I got my degree in exercise science. Okay. And the most valuable thing I got at SPU when I was in college was how to read research. Okay, yeah. And how to see whether a study is valid or not. And then to look at similar studies or other scientists that have repeated that study, to see how scientific it is, and then see the cool stuff, the new stuff that yeah. comes out, okay. and then just sort of experimenting. So I started this experimentation back in 1987. Okay. And... That was still when Arnold was still pretty hot. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, bodybuilding was really huge in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. And then towards the late 80s and the 90s, it wasn't so huge anymore. Mm -hmm. And people were kind of over the getting huge thing, getting big, bulky, and they wanted something, they still wanted fitness, yeah. but they wanted to look and feel fit, defined, muscle tone, lean, strong, healthy, all that stuff, but not big anymore, okay. especially in the 90s. So people didn't want to get big anymore, but they wanted to get lean and fit. Yeah. They wanted to look and feel strong. Yeah. Yeah. And I could see that trend happening okay. here in the late 80s when I was researching this stuff and getting my degree. So you grew up in the Seattle area? I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Grew up on Mercer Island. Okay. Mm -hmm. Went to school in Bellevue, Seattle, so I've been a local okay. most of my life. That's a rare thing around yeah. Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, there's a lot of newer transplants in the area, especially lately. Oh, ah, yeah. This place has just exploded. Yeah, yeah. But it's always been that way. I mean, it's always been a great place to live. Okay, yeah. yeah. And when my friends come out and visit from other parts of the country, they're just shocked at how beautiful it is, how much fun stuff there is to do, and they want to move here. I don't blame them. Yeah. Shh, don't tell anybody. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. All right, so you studied um, exercise science at uh, SPU, Seattle Pacific U University, yep. right? Mm -hmm. um, what what did you do after that? So you started noticing this trend. Yeah, and yeah. so when I was there in college, I was writing research papers, you know, for part of the curriculum, and one of the papers I wrote was on a subject that my professor was teaching that I, I kind of questioned. I thought, oh, I don't, that doesn't sound quite right, and it was about eccentric exercise, eccentric uh, motions. Okay, tell me, let's pause right there. What is eccentric exercise? Yes, thank you. Exercise? Good idea. <laughs> so eccentric is the contraction where you're resisting going down. Okay. Resisting against gravity okay. while the muscle is lengthening. Okay. So concentric is the other way. Okay. So you're lifting something. Yeah. Eccentric is resisting as it's controlling the speed on the way down. Okay. So at the time, 
science was indicating that there really wasn't much benefit to the eccentric phase of the contraction. Oh. Mostly people... just concentric. Okay. I thought, oh, that's kind of weird because, yeah. you know, with my own experience, it doesn't seem really seem to be the case. And yeah. when I do heavy eccentric, especially heavy eccentric or negatives, I get really sore. And yeah. sometimes sore is an indicator of, you know, good muscle work and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Not all the time. Anyways. No pain, no gain, they say, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's mean... some truth to that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not complete 100% truth yeah. to that. So, anyways, I was, uh, I thought, well, that would be a fun subject to do in my research paper because, you know, you have to do a big research paper at the end. So I did that, and I knew my professor would think it's great because he's super open-minded, and he, he's really into the latest research, too, and he okay. thought that would be fun new information if, if I could debunk, really, what he was saying. So oh. I did, and I did my presentation. He's like, wow, that was great. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to change my curriculum and all that kind oh, of stuff. Oh, wow. Because what I found was eccentric was just as good, and sometimes in some cases a little bit better than the concentric phase hmm. and it, they both have their advantages but they're both just as good and okay. one is not inferior to the other so that was the paper you know that proved that to be the case nice. and so then that just really got me excited about research and just started devouring it and started probably two hours a day since then since 1987 I've averaged two hours a day, studying research, mostly in exercise, but a lot of okay. research in nutrition, and a ton of research in brain science. Mm. And so I've learned a lot since 1987. Yeah, I would say that probably puts you in the top tier of, I don't know, one to two or five percent mm -hmm. of the people out there that are instructing people in yeah. exercise. Like mm -hmm. most, I would imagine that most people out there just get their certification, maybe not even a degree, yes. and then, and then right. they just go and... Uh, yeah, most trainers get the weekend certification yeah. where, you know, they read a couple books and then when that certification company is coming yeah. through town or in a hotel room, sit down and take a test and now they're yeah. certified. Yeah. So it doesn't really mean a whole lot, unfortunately, yeah. uh, with our industry to be a certified personal trainer. Uh, Sounds like you really have like head to toe, inside and out understanding of how mm -hmm. the human body works. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what helped me develop the methodology that we have at the X Gym. So okay. we've got seven different splinter techniques, or seven different methods, and we've got 30 different splinter techniques. And by method, I mean how we're doing the rep itself. Okay. By splinter techniques, I'm talking about what we do at the end when we get to muscle fatigue or beyond, which okay. we usually go beyond that. So uh, the methodology was developed with my own clients as guinea pigs. Okay. When I graduated SPO, I was a trainer mostly out of people's homes and a couple of clubs in the area. And I just was experimenting with them. And they knew it right from the start. I said, you know, I'm an exercise scientist. And so yeah. I also happen to be a personal trainer, but my main thing is exercise science. So okay. you're going to be a guinea pig and we're going to try really cool stuff. And some of it's going to work and some of it's not going to work. You're, and we're going to see. Okay. And then the stuff that is going to work, we're going to keep doing. And the stuff that doesn't work, we'll find out pretty quick and we won't do it anymore yeah. and that kind of stuff. And they're really into that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fun. And so then they started telling all their friends and family and then the business grew to the point where I had to scale myself. So, and then in 1998, I uh, opened up the X Gym. Okay. And then... Where'd the name come from? You know, that's a funny story because... All the other letters of the alphabet were taken and then... Yeah, right? <laughs> so my original client back in, oh, I think it was 88, uh, Melissa, I worked with her for quite a while and she just she had a blast, got great results, was thrilled, was got totally into fitness, was became one of a passion one of her passions and so she said you know or, or, around 95 she said I kind of want to open a gym and I said cool you know let's I can help you with that and so kind of on a consulting basis mm -hmm. uh, helped her out open a gym in 96 in Belltown in Seattle and so I offered her my methodology because mm -hmm. I had it developed by then and she goes no nah, you know it's really complicated because she'd been doing it mm -hmm. and it'd be really hard to teach and so I just want to stick with, at that time, what was called super slow, which is a great method. It's okay. just slow motion. Okay. And so I go, okay, uh, the problem you're going to have is that it's only one method. Mm. And so 
you can change exercises from time to time, which is great, and then traditional training does that. But it's since it's the same method, you're still gonna have your clients are gonna plateau over time. When you change methods and exercise, mm -hmm. you don't get those plateaus. Mm, yeah. So she goes, I know, but you know, still, it's just so high maintenance what you've <laughs> developed, and it really is. And I still want to do it. I still want to do super slow because it's a good method, and it is. So like, all right. So she opened that up. That was in '96. And the funny thing is, she was trying to come up with a name mm. back in 95. And so she's running names by her husband, and he's a good marketing brain. And so he's throwing out really good names and everything, and it's high intensity and muscle burn. Mm -hmm. So they, they were leaning towards hell and back okay, okay. as a name. Okay. But you know, it's just yeah. some connotations and things, so they didn't <laughs> want to go there. And so he kept throwing stuff out, and you know she'd be she just kind of shoot it down. So he was starting to feel a little bit over criticized because his ideas are good. And so finally he got to the point where he in frustration he just threw up his arms and he goes, okay, well then how about something generic like X Gym? Okay. And she goes, oh. And she said, I like that. And so she went with it. And then two years later, I'm talking to her on the phone because you know we're friends the whole time and. Um, so just kind of catching up, and I was telling her that I was going to open a gym in Issaquah. It's going to be a rock climbing, combination rock climbing, and uh, personal training with my methodology. She goes, no, don't do that. She goes, buy the X gym. Mm. I go, why? I didn't know it was for sale. She goes, well, it's not, but I really want you to have it because you were right about the multi-methods, mm -hmm. and you were right about how it's going, and besides, I want to start traveling more and learn Italian. Okay. So, <laughs> so said, she started a kind of started it for you got it off I mean, kind of yeah the name at least yeah the name yeah and so and some some clients that came with it okay and the machines and the location and so she did a lot of stuff because that's a lot of stuff to yeah do. yeah and so i said all right well you know get let's all get together and and give me an offer and we'll see you know if, what, what works so we got together and she gave me this amazing offer and you only hear about yeah, okay. in stories. <laughs> and I said, Melissa, you realize you're totally ripping yourself off <laughs> with this offer. Because it was less than the build out would have cost oh, for a new gym. Wow. And but I'm I'm getting some clients, I'm getting equipment, and yeah. so it's like she's totally jipping herself out. And so she goes, Yeah, I know, but we really want you to have it because, you know, we like the clients that we have and we know they're gonna be in good hands and and we just want you to do this instead of the Ezequah idea. And so we really want you to try and talk you into it. And I go, okay, ow. Yeah, ow. yeah. Ow. And so that's how it started. And, and um, you know, expanded that club and uh, opened up Alki and Kirkland. And, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about some client results. But first, I'm really curious how, what happened before you decided to get your degree in exercise science at SPU. Like, what were, what early in your life led you to that? Well, I've always been interested in psychology. Okay. And so that's what I came into SPU, to intending to do. Okay. To get my my major in psychology and then my master's and then do counseling. Okay. Oh, okay. Because you know that's a passion and brain stuff has always been a passion and so. Uh, I was a psychology major until I was a junior and then my senior year. Well, my junior year, I started doing other classes to kind of offset the psychology. Mm -hmm. So I took windsurfing, and wow, that was really fun. I took scuba diving, wow, that was really fun. And the professor that taught both of those is an awesome, cool guy. And so, uh, and he was a professor, you know, in the PE department, kinesiology and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, we were talking, he knew why I was taking those classes. And he goes, well, you know, why do you seem to have an interest in this? Because I'd been working out since high school and I, I interest was, fitness was definitely a passion along with psychology. So he said, why don't you take some more classes? And so, all right, what do you suggest next? And he goes, well, maybe kinesiology. All right, cool, I'll take kinesiology. And then took kines, and that was fascinating. Oh. And then I wanted to take A and P, and so then well, I'm Well, we probably should pause and even explain what is kinesiology. Kinesiology is human movement. Okay. So joints and muscles and angles and tendons and all that kind of stuff. Line oh, of so pole. You could, you could name the greater trochanter yeah, and the... Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. 
Wait, where is that? Is that the one that's here? That's the hip, okay. yeah. <laughs> I remember a little bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> and then A and P, anatomy and physiology. Yeah, physiology. Okay. Yeah, and I'm just eating this stuff up, and then I'm thinking, you know, I like psychology, but I love this stuff that I'm getting into mm. now, and so I could probably make more money as a psychologist than a personal trainer. But I bet you I'd be a lot happier as a personal mm. trainer than a psychologist. Okay. So I went for happiness. I changed majors. This was my senior year oh, when wow. I changed. So that put me there another year. Okay. But my dad was a professor there. I got 95% off tuition. Oh. And so... You got nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, 5%. Might as well just tack so, on an extra year. So is your dad a psychology professor? No. Okay. Business. CPA. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. The opposite side of the, the brain. Right. <laughs> yeah. So then um, I just couldn't stop studying the research. And okay. every it's like it's an addiction. It's still an addiction. And uh, I just have to do it every day. And if, if even if I have to stay up late, if I go to, if, if, if it's bedtime and I haven't done research, I'm like, ah, and I have to do it. So I do it. And, and when my mom was diagnosed in about 2001 with Alzheimer's, I started to uh, study more brain stuff. Okay. I was interested in that, and I always did research, but because yeah. just psychology and everything it interests me. But I put more energy into that, and so since two thousand one, I've been devouring that research too. Okay. And she passed in two thousand five, and um, but you know I just never let up because it's just so interesting, and and if I could help other people, that would be really fun too. Yeah. So I've learned a ton about brain science and how the brain works and how nutrition integrates with that and exercise integrates with that. And then exercise science and nutrition science. Okay. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah, it's That's fun. a really broad, um, I mean, it's broad, but it's also very specific. Yeah. Like you have a very, um, I, I guess, a, a depth of knowledge is yeah. what I should say. Yeah. Of how things And interact. it's really health. Yeah. You know, when it yeah. comes to it, it's, there are certainly specific things you mm -hmm. can do for specific parts of the brain and certain foods you can eat and supplements you can take and, uh, and, and that's all great. But what it comes down to is health. Mm. And so I've really come full circle to there. And if it's making you healthier, it's good for you. It's good for your heart. It's good for your brain. It's good for your mood. It's good for all the other organs, your, even your skin, everything, because that's an organ. Mm. And so that's the approach we have now at X-Gym and with the people I talk with. It's not about getting ripped. It's not about getting lean, reducing weight, especially reducing weight. It's about getting healthy. Mm. And so what we explain to everybody, our clients and my friends, family, everybody I can who will listen, is get healthy. Just do what it takes to get healthy. Yeah. Everything else will fall into place. And you'll lose the fat that you want to lose without having to concentrate on it. Mm -hmm. And weight, if that's important, then you know that'll take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Because once you reach optimal health, yeah. you also reach optimal weight. Mm -hmm. You also reach optimal body fat percentage. You also you reach optimal brain functioning. Mm -hmm. You you get younger mm -hmm. because healthy health is young mm -hmm. is youth. And so all of those things fall into place without having to compartmentalize anything mm. or focus on any one thing. Yeah, yeah. That go I always tell people that you have to get your biology in line mm -hmm. and then the rest of it takes care of itself. And what I mean yeah. by that is that when you're eating in a way and taking care of your body in a mm -hmm. way that you're working with your biology mm -hmm. rather than fighting against it, mm -hmm. things are much easier and yeah. people don't have to use willpower to mm -hmm. restrict to restrict calories and force themselves to go work out when their yep. body is just tired and so then they're done that get the biology lined up first and then yeah. all that other stuff falls into place mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so t been there done that tell me about that then. oh yeah gosh i've been through everything um back in high school you know i was doing the whole fitness thing is really when it started and it's also doing the you know the protein window and all that kind of stuff all the things that have been marketed by yeah. protein supplement companies mm. to sell more product okay and I believed it you know I read muscle and fitness and back in the 80s I wanted to be big and huge like you Schwarzenegger saw, you saw those before and after photos and yeah the, I know uh, yeah ads right <laughs> yeah right now I know what a scam those are I mean <laughs> 
because you, you you hear about these books or these companies that have these you know big transformation contests, mm -hmm. and so you know two hundred thousand people sign up to do it, and twenty thousand people end up finishing. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you that, and then out of those twenty thousand people, ten thousand submit their before and after pictures. And out of that 10,000, you got five or six that are pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the ones they use. And so everybody assumes that, yeah. you know, oh, this is a miracle product. Yeah. Because look at these five or six photos that are phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. So it's just marketing stuff. Well, and it's lighting and, uh, yeah. you know, some of exactly. that stuff Exactly. <laughs> yeah, straight on for the before yeah. and above for the after. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, that whole thing is is where I've been through all that stuff. I even did one of those contests. Okay. I bought into all that stuff. But then as I started getting more research done, I started getting smarter mm -hmm. and um, seeing around everything and really understanding the physiology and nutrition, brain science, and coming up with my own stuff because what we have as far as what current recommendations are being given to us, you know, from the government or mainstream or whatever it is, is severely outdated. Mm -hmm. And some of it's just wrong. Yeah. And it's hard for them to admit. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, Ansel Keys came out with the whole thing that, you know, fat's bad mm -hmm. and uh, got everybody afraid of fat. And so we all went low fat and fat consumption went way down and it worked as far as what they told us to do because as a nation we did what they were mm -hmm. saying to do yeah. and then got huge unhealthy yeah. sick and it, it, so the pandemic do you want from, another snack wells cookie yeah right <laughs> yeah it's only 100 calories you can <laughs> no fat <laughs> uh, yeah right and so a huge disservice and um you know towards the end of key's life he well even before that he was openly admitting hey mm -hmm. dude, I'm totally wrong yeah but he didn't want to go public with it because it's you know ego and yeah. all that kind of stuff and the government can't come out and say oh sorry everybody yeah. for making you sick and fat yeah because then nobody listens to him anymore they're like oh you suck I'm not going to listen to anything you say anymore yeah. they can't afford that to happen yeah. it's already happening but they can't afford it to happen yeah. more and so they have to phase phase in information mm -hmm. in steps. They can't just mm -hmm. come out and say, do the opposite of everything we've been telling you. <laughs> they have to do it one step at a time. Yeah. And which they're starting to do, so to their yeah. credit, that's fantastic. Yeah, because this year's dietary recommendations came out where cholesterol was no longer concerned and, yep. and saturated fat was also loosened, loosened up. So. Yes, and, right. And salt too, as I remember as well, right? Didn't they? Yes. Did they let go of that a little bit too? Yes, yeah. yes. So they are starting to loosen up on some of that stuff. Yeah. And I apologize. Like, every day I apologize to my clients or people I'm interviewing for enrolling my program. I, I apologize. I say, I know that what I'm going to teach you is going to be the opposite of yeah. what we've been told for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. I'm sorry. I believed it. I was on that bandwagon in 95, Same. eating low-fat yeah. everything. Oh, yeah. I and was, too. Yeah. yeah. So I apologize. I, I'll apologize to you right now, too. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize to past clients all the time. Yeah, sorry, yeah. kind of screwed you up. <laughs> Here's the truth now, yeah. and you know we actually really know, and I know I've seen the research to back it up. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I feel bad. Mm -hmm. You know, I did it myself. I misguided people, mm -hmm. but you know we didn't know any better. Right. Frankly. Right, right. And when you talk about research, especially with exercise science, and mostly with nutrition too, it really wasn't even done on a large scale until the '80s. Yeah. Because in the 70s, people didn't really care because obesity wasn't an issue. Right. People were in pretty good shape because mm -hmm. they were active and they were out doing fun stuff. And then computers, sedentary jobs, um, processed foods, high fructose corn syrup, all that stuff started coming on the market and coming into our lives. And then we're getting bigger and sicker. And then in the 80s, people start caring because that's mm -hmm. when it really started to happen. Yeah. You start to take off the whole obesity thing and high fructose corn syrup and all the other things. And... So now when people care, then there's money funding mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. Before that, there wasn't any money to fund it. And so, A, we didn't care. B, there wasn't any money to do studies. So the 80s, that starts to happen, which is great. And that's when I started getting into the research. And that's when I discovered, 
I'm a pioneer <laughs> because the research is new. Yeah. The concept of doing research in exercise and nutrition is just starting now. Yeah. This is really cool. This is really fun. Yeah. And so it just kind of rode that wave and uh, made mistakes along with everybody else. But uh, over time came up with stuff that actually works. So what works? How? Well, what I tell people is, and, and the other thing that the government's done is they've pre pretty much thrown out the food pyramid. Yeah. Which is good. I mean, they, they tried to revamp it, but, you know, that was just as bad. And, now, we and, have, now we have MyPlate. Yeah, which, MyPlate. You know, it's a good transition between... Right. Yeah, it's a good yeah, good idea. But I, what I tell <laughs> people is, take the old food pyramid, turn it upside down, and eat like that. Okay. And then and reshape it, right? Yeah. So whatever was at the top... Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fats at the top. So start with that. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, fat's amazing, yeah. and and it's an essential nutrient, and we have to have it, or yeah. we die. Yeah. Yeah. Same with protein. We have to have it, or we die. Not so with carbs. Okay. Especially sugar. We can get along just fine without it. Yeah. Just ask any Eskimo, and they've lived for generations. Yeah. How thousands of years? That I don't know when the that race started, but it's got to be, what, 10,000 to 50,000 years ago, whatever. Right. And... Well, grains came on the scene about 10,000 years ago. So, right. Yeah. And they're one of the few um, races that didn't get on the grain bandwagon. Mm. Too cold up there. Because they don't grow up yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 95% of their calories are coming from animal products. And they're eating a ton of blubber. Mm. That's the main thing. Mm-hmm. And they're eating meat, and then they're getting their vitamins and minerals from eating organs. And that's what they do. And they've generations and generations and generations without cancer, without obesity, without diabetes, without getting sick. And people argue, oh, yeah, but their lifespan is only in the 40s. Well, that's because the mort infant mortality rate's factored in. Mm. And they don't have modern medicine, to so a lot of the infants die, or the mom dies with the infant during childbirth. And then they also don't have, or now they do, and they also have Western diets, so this doesn't really apply anymore because yeah, yeah. now they are getting diabetes and heart disease and cancer and all those kinds of things. But the ancient, or the even 100 years ago, um, Eskimos, uh, would they also didn't have the hospitals to, to set their leg when they break it. Mm. Or you know, treat an infection or something like that, mm -hmm. so they died from that too, yeah. often. Yeah. So when you factor all those things in, yeah, it's in the mid-40s. But when you look at, when you take those factors out, mm -hmm. you see people living to their 80s, 90s, or older on this kind of a diet. You're yeah. like, oh, yeah, huh, there's yeah. got to be something. Without any disease, right. got to be something to that. Vegans hate when I say this. <laughs> and I have tons of vegan friends. Yeah. And, I, yeah. and I love them to death. They love me. And, and I think for certain people... Being a vegan is fantastic, mm -hmm. especially if they completely educate themselves first, yeah. learn how to do it right, mm -hmm. and and then if it's for you know uh, ethical reasons, mm -hmm. great, go mm -hmm. for it, mm -hmm. because I think there's a really strong argument there too. But no matter how somebody chooses to eat, it should to be to become healthy, and they should completely educate themselves or find an expert to help on how to do it the proper way to optimize their health along the way. Right, right. Yeah. So how did, how did your journey go from 1995 prescribing low-fat diets to modern day turn the pyramid upside down and eat lots of fat? Mm -hmm. What was that journey like? How did you get from A to B? Well, I'm a scientist in a lot of ways, and so the, the way that I would try things out, because I'm skeptical about everything. Mm. And uh, even keto, I was skeptical about at first. And I just didn't believe it. By default, I start with the assumption that it's wrong. Okay. I don't believe it. And I'm going to see what happens. So it minimizes placebo effect. Um, it doesn't, you can't ever completely eliminate placebo. Mm -hmm. But if you can't, and there is a placebo in there, and it's working, great. Stick with that placebo yeah. because it's working, right? And the brain is that strong and that powerful mm -hmm. to make placebos work. Right. So I'm not anti-placebo. I'm definitely pro-placebo, but as a scientist, I try to minimize that as much mm -hmm. as I can. So 
the first step is to read the research, see if something sounds valid, and then try it myself. And this is with exercise, brain, or nutrition. So I try it myself, and if it turns out that it, it works on me, mm -hmm. then I try it on friends and family, people that won't sue me. <laughs> and then if it works on them, I try it on some of my employees, and so you won't see me either, hopefully. <laughs> and hasn't happened yet. And then if it works on them, I try it on some of my members who have been long term because they love fun stuff and they know that actually X gym is a science gym and it's a lab, as well as a workout facility. And so you know they get that. And then if it works on them, that's enough people to come out and say, hey. Here's something kind of cool. Let's try it out. Mm -hmm. And then more people try it out, and they see the results from them. Yeah. And so that's what I do with every process. Okay. And it's not completely scientific, but it is effective in mm -hmm. finding some stuff that works for human beings. Yeah. And that's that's how I found most of the stuff that okay. works that I tend to, to promote. So do you have any um, interesting stories about like when you started experimenting with higher fat diet for yourself? Mm -hmm. So uh, I was extremely skeptical, even though I knew the science, I understood the science, mm -hmm. I understood the physiology. How the, long ago was this when you started experimenting with this? With higher fat? Yeah. Oh, uh, when I started probably 10 years ago. Okay. I, I, I was thinking about it. 15 years ago, okay. but it took five years to get the courage out <laughs> <laughs> to, to really try it. Because All right, so if you're out there and you're still afraid of fat, give yourself yeah. a break because it may yeah. take a few years. <laughs> yeah, right. Because I was so brainwashed. I mean, mm -hmm. just along with everybody else. Yeah. I was I was convinced yeah, that fat, fat clogs was your bad. arteries. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it just makes sense. <laughs> yeah, right. It does make a lot of intuitive sense that yeah. if, if you don't if you don't want to get fatter, yeah. Don't eat fat. Right, right, right? yeah. Because so, you just, whatever you eat goes straight into your blood and then straight into your, yeah, right. your, your tissues. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And so even the research I was reading that says it's opposite of that, actually, mm. I was having a hard time believing. And so finally got up the courage to eat more fat, and, and it was transformational. And, you know, mm -hmm. with, with mental clarity, with energy, I mean, my energy instead, because I used to be a carb guy just like everybody mm -hmm. else, and my energy would just be up and down all day. Mm -hmm. And when it's really low, hormones are affected, mood is affected, mm -hmm. and, you know, I turn into a different person. So this Jekyll and Hyde thing going mm -hmm. on, and I didn't want that anymore. I didn't want to have to feel like I take, I need to take a nap three times a day. I mean, this is crazy. It's yeah, not, that's yeah. not what healthy people are like. Yeah. And so I did the high fat thing in combination with the reducing the carbs thing. Okay. And because what I was explaining to people at the time was that if you, it's a combination of calories that's the real thing here. Right, right. So fat by itself isn't fattening, it's slimming. But when you put sugar in there with it, or any fast carb, mm -hmm. like a starch, yeah. then you're cranking up your insulin, mm -hmm. and your insulin, elevated insulin, puts you in a storing mode. Yeah. So you're gonna store stuff. You're yeah. gonna store more protein, you're gonna store more fat, you're gonna store more of everything. Lets it into the cell. And so, if you're gonna eat more fat, you can't keep your carbs where it is, because yeah. then you're just gonna store it. Because yeah. here's your ability to store those carbs take that insulin down, and then your sugar down, fast carbs, starches, then without high elevated insulin, you're not in a storing mode. Mm -hmm. You're actually in a burning mode. Yeah. And so the fat that you eat is gonna get burned off. Yeah. And then some. Mm -hmm. So I was doing for that reasons, but also for health reasons. That was really my main emphasis is because all the research that I was reading was indicating that that's how our body's designed. Mm. And we made it for thousands, thousands, thousands of years yeah. eating that way. Yeah. And that's how we ate 10,000 years ago before the ag agricultural revolution. Mm -hmm. We ate a lot of animal products and a lot of fat mm -hmm. and very little carbs. Mm -hmm. And the carbs that we were eating, the vegetables that we were eating, were green mm -hmm. and they're slow carbs. Mm -hmm. And there were a few tiny little berries and... 
Right, yeah. but they were teeny tiny. Right. They're not bred like they are today. You, you couldn't you couldn't even gather, you know, 10 cups of them to eat at one time. No. Not, let alone one cup. <laughs> exactly. It's just too, it takes too much time. Yeah. And by the time you're done picking the berries and eating them, it's taken so much time that you're hungry because you burned <laughs> them all off. They were they didn't have blackberry pies right, right. back then. Right. So, well, because you can see here in the northwest we have blackberries that grow like oh my gosh, it's they cover acres yeah. of land, yeah. but they're the uh, the Himalayan, right? Or the they're these giant blackberries that I can't believe we have them everywhere that grow on every vacant lot. Except people will pay at the grocery store six dollars for a half <laughs> pint of them. I don't understand that. But they're not the the they were as far as I understand they came over from Europe and they're not even native to this area. And so we've got yeah. the little once in a while you go hiking in the right spot you can find the tiny little native yeah. blackberries and they're very tiny. Yeah. And so just imagining the difference of, you know, uh, the big ones are, I don't know, 20 times as big. And uh -huh. so, yeah. yeah, you get so much more sugar in those than you got yeah. the native ones that were here, you know, 100, 300 years ago. Right. So. And the gram for gram, the little ones yeah. compared to the big ones mm -hmm. have way less sugar. Right, right. Because the big ones have been bred mm -hmm. for sugar. Same thing with our other starchy, sugary products yeah. that we have that we've grown. Like wheat, for example, has been... Ancient wheat mm -hmm. has been bred off the surface of the planet. It's not; it doesn't exist anymore. So the wheat two thousand years ago, where you read in the Bible about Jesus walking through the wheat fields, popping the heads off and eating them with his disciples, that wheat that wheat does not yeah. exist on our planet anywhere on our planet. It's extinct, and it's our fault. And it's too bad because that wheat did have some nutritional value. Mm -hmm. Modern wheat doesn't. I don't care where you go. I don't on the planet. There's better wheat. There's less bad wheat. <laughs> <laughs> but the good stuff is gone. Mm. So, and, and the stuff that we've bred into existence that we have now, we have no business eating mm. as humans. Yeah. Because it's so modern, we haven't had time for our physiology mm. to accommodate this new product. And if you look, if you're an evolutionist and you say we've been around for you know hundreds of thousands or even millions of years, um, and then you look at when the agricultural revolution started and when we started eating this stuff, it was about 10 minutes ago, mm -hmm. as far as, you know, mm -hmm. the regular lifespan. And that's not much time. Mm -hmm. That's certainly not enough time yeah. for the digestive system to change and adapt to it. If you're a creationist and you're thinking we've been around for, you know, 10,000 years, then it was last week that we started eating. Same problem. Yeah. We just haven't had time. And so this modern stuff is making us fat and sick yeah. because our physiology isn't supposed to be eating it. It's actually a poison. It's yeah. a slow poison, but it's still a poison. And so that's what a lot of people have a hard time with because they don't want to believe it mm -hmm. because they're addicted to it. Right. And right. they're addicted to it because yeah. of what it does to their brain chemistry. Yeah. And the reason it does that to their brain is because we've bred that over time. Right, right. Because we eat this stuff, these new strains that come out, and we get this hit in our brain. Yeah, we go, oh, that's yeah. a good strain. So yeah. we keep going with that strain. Yeah. And then now we have this, this proliferation of addictive brain chemical yeah. food that yeah. we're eating, and we're medicating ourselves with yeah. our food mm -hmm. instead of eating it for health. Yeah. And you go up to the mountains and you find one of those berries, it doesn't taste very good <laughs> because we're comparing it. Yeah to the big old huge blackberries that yeah. we have now. Mm -hmm. And in comparison, it doesn't taste very good. Yeah. But jump in a time machine and go back 10,000 years and pick one of those berries, you oh, this is great. Yeah. But like you said, you just can't eat enough for yeah. it to be a problem mm -hmm. because they're tiny and it's a lot of work to pick them. And yeah. So you're not making blackberry pies and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and uh, you know, a lot of people have a easier time jumping on the like, getting off of gluten and weed and understanding that that's not that great but i run into a lot i'm really surprised how many people say well i guess i'm not surprised because it makes sense for what we've been told but they have a hard time with well fruit fruit's healthy right um, because the government's lumped that in as fruit and vegetables that's one thing yeah and so they have to equally be as healthy but i can just you know you can do a ex uh, mental experiment right now is just in your own lifetime think about how apples have changed mm -hmm. 
I know when I was a kid, my mom sent me an apple every day in my lunch, mm -hmm. and we had three choices. It was Granny Smith, Golden Delicious, or Red Delicious. Yeah. None of them were tasty. No. They were tiny little apples. Yeah. I, I threw it out every day. I, I, I confessed to my mom years ago that I was throwing out the apple, yeah. and she says... She goes, oh, I thought you liked it. That's why I sent it every day, because you never yeah. came home with it. And I was like, yeah. oh, I felt so guilty for wasting all that food. And we've since made up after that. But, yeah, that's good. But, yeah, just, you know, the apples when I was a kid were this little. And now we've got yeah. the giant size of a small child's head, yeah. honey crisp apples. And the difference in those is just pure sugar has been yeah. added to it. Yeah. Hair is going and less hair. fiber. And if it's if it's uh, GM, uh, GM oh, food. Yeah then it's got tons of fertilizers to make it grow faster. Mm -hmm. So it spends less time in the ground because the farmer makes more money because they're yeah. selling it by weight and they want to grow it faster to, to, to have more seasons mm -hmm. in the year and you know turn it over and make a bunch of money. So it's bigger and spending less time in the ground and the ground is what it's soaking up the nutrients. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's getting its nutrients. And so you got, you got this new fruit and veggie that is huge spent little to no time in the ground and or growing in a lab even worse a lot of that too and it just doesn't have even a tenth of the nutrients and the nutrients does that it does have are out of whack because right, they didn't have right. enough time to get them in whack right. <laughs> and so not to mention that the field is depleted for monocropping bingo and, yeah, yeah yeah a whole bunch of problems yeah so that's certainly an yeah. issue so i'm curious did you start out on the paleo bandwagon and then morph into keto did you make that uh was that part of your wagon wagon wheel journey of yeah i mean paleo makes sense to me and okay. when i don't have time to explain more specifics on, mm -hmm. on how to do nutrition i'll tell someone you heard of paleo go for it and there's tons of recipes online yeah. i mean we're not hurting anybody can the people that like variety because they used to complain to me oh well, yeah but you know i don't want to do this because there's not enough variety i need my variety Great. Well, there's plenty of variety now. I got the interwebs and <laughs> yes, you got yes. all these recipes yeah. out there and more variety than you could ever eat in a lifetime if you ate something different every meal. Right. And they're all delicious. So go paleo. Yeah. And then for the people I have more time explaining, then I, I tweak it a little bit further and I go, go primal, like, you know, Marxist and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then for the people I have more time yet, then I, I get a little bit, I say, well, my personal preference kind of tweaking on those two philosophies is I'm okay with dairy and uh, but not so much with fruit so that's the main difference okay and the reason I'm okay with dairy is because I know the difference between conventional dairy mm. and grass-fed dairy mm -hmm. and raw dairy and grass-fed raw that kind of stuff it's all awesome and Jersey cow versus Jersey, exact, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. big differences there and do, you, do you want some Twin Brooks cream when we get done yeah, with this? Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and then with fruit, you know, a lot of people say, well, fruit's a health food. Because mm. yeah, it's fruits and vegetables. It's one thing. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Not modern fruit. Mm. That's the problem. Yeah. Same thing with yeah. modern grains and some modern vegetables. And so, I'm not a huge fruit fan. And um, I had just recently was talking to a ex-gym member who is already pretty lean, but he wanted to get leaner. And so, you know, we're talking about healthy eating and all this kind of stuff, and we went over the fruit thing, but you must not have heard that part because he comes back yeah. a month later and goes, yeah, you know, I gained two pounds of fat, what's up? Because we have this really fancy BEI machine okay. in Body 570, and so it measures very accurately body fat percentage. So I go, well, give me a food log, we'll figure it out. Because 95% of the time, I can figure it out with the accurate food log. And if I can't, it's, you know, there's some other hormone stuff going on that we got to figure out. So he gives me his food log back, and there's a ton of fruit on there. And I'm like, well, he must he must be tell, measuring the fruit, estimating it wrong or something. So I'm like, you know, let's go over this fruit thing. Where, first of all, where are you buying your fruit? And he goes, oh, I go to Costco and I get organic. I go, great. Awesome, organic. So, how how much are you buying? He goes, well, you know, I buy it's, it's least expensive flat at a time, so I buy the flat. Mm -hmm. I go, okay. Um, 
and then the red flag went up because fruit goes bad, especially organic fruit goes bad faster because it's, you know, it's more natural and it's supposed to. And so I go, okay, so how, how fast do you go through a flat of peaches or I forgot what it was? He goes, oh, about a week. We go, okay, yeah, so here's the problem. Or something, yeah. yeah, yeah, here's the problem. Uh, fructose yeah. is the problem. Fruit is healthy to some extent because, you know, it's got the fiber and stuff way better than fruit juice, which mm -hmm. fiber's all stripped out, it's just the sugar, but to an extent mm -hmm. because it has fructose. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much fiber's in that piece of fruit, yeah. there's also fructose in that piece of fruit. And for most fruit, I mean, like fruit like avocados and oh. lemons and limes, stuff like that, it's very low fructose, and that's awesome. I eat a ton of those things. but. The high fructose fruits, the higher the fructose, the more fattening it is. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, fructose won't necessarily spike your insulin levels and put you in a fat storing mode some of the time, but it'll get you the other way because mm -hmm. fruit is processed in the liver just like alcohol. And so, and alcohol calories, fructose calories, they're both going to turn, at least half of those calories are going to turn into fat, maybe more, depending on activity level and other macronutrients. So that's how it's fattening. Yeah, and, and like we were talking about, the, the way that fruit have been, has been hybridized yeah. recently in the last, you know, five or ten years even. It's oh, just gosh, yeah. packed with fructose now. Every compared year, to what it, was. it gets like, more fattening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, like going back even farther, I mean, I know the difference in apples in my lifetime, but going back even farther, apples weren't native to the United States. They mm -hmm. were brought over from England. Mm -hmm. They were tiny little things. They were crab apples. They were not eaten as a fruit. They, yeah. the only thing that could be done with them is fermented and turned into cider. Mm -hmm. And that was a safe drinking liquid mm -hmm. to drink at that time because they didn't have sanitation for liquids. And so yeah. apples weren't a fruit or a right. health food. They were uh, you know, a way to drink some alcohol yeah. back in the early colonial days. Yeah. So that's where they started from. So. Right. Um, suddenly because they've got a lot of sugar in them and they're giant they're they're health food now like yeah. it doesn't make any sense so no <laughs> it's nature's junk food nature's junk food oh yeah. i like that because i always hear nature's candy but nature's junk food mm -hmm. that's awesome you to tm that yeah right <laughs> <laughs> and right. a little bit's okay yeah you know because it, it does have vitamins and minerals mm -hmm. and that's fine um for me it's a trigger it's a brain yeah. trigger well and i know i i have a a fairly close friend that's type 2 diabetic and mm -hmm. um, she was having trouble getting her she eats fairly low carb mm -hmm. um, and and you know it's non medicated type 2 by diabetes she just manages it with um, diet mm -hmm. and she found though that um, she couldn't figure out how to get her morning fasting blood glucose mm -hmm. down below a hundred it was you know 108 or so and yeah. she was having a half an apple every day mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, ah, eh, that's actually kind of a lot of uh, mm -hmm. sugar in there. You might look at that. No, 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 it's fruit, it's fine, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And I think finally she relented and gave in, and, and yeah. she found when she cut that out, or her fasting blood glucose came down. So, yeah. I don't know, some of the fruits, I wouldn't even say a little bit's okay, but yeah. um, some of the berries, I think. But it depends, right? Yeah. Like, have you found it that? Depends. that it depends. It depends on each person is really unique and what they can tolerate. The so. super high fiber fruit and the low fructose fruit, yeah. you know, a little bit's okay. Yeah. But... I stay completely away from the high, the high fructose fruit, and especially if it's high fructose, low fiber. But it's a, it's a trigger food for a lot of people, and me too. Um, now, I've trained my brain, so I don't even crave the stuff that I used to eat. Mm -hmm. I, and that's atrocious. Gosh, I could go all day on what I on the crap that I used to eat. <laughs> but um, for a lot of people it's a trigger. Mm -hmm. And so they're eating this healthy food right. and then boom, now they're eating a health, unhealthy food because their brain's been triggered to crave that. And right. So now they go for the chips right, right. or whatever candy bar or whatever it else it is. That makes sense why years ago, whenever I'd eat an apple, I was hungry and half hour later, now I get it. Mm -hmm. so yeah. That it's, was filling. How could I, how could I be hunger? Exactly. Well, maybe the insulin spike as well from all yes. the fructose right. or the sugar in it. Yeah. And anytime you get that insulin spike ups and downs, it affects your hormones, mm -hmm. and your hormones affects your thoughts, mm -hmm. and your thoughts affects your actions. Right. So that's how it cascades mm -hmm. into this situation where 
you, you're eating the stuff that you, you swore you wouldn't eat or don't want to eat. You know it's unhealthy, but you can't help it. Right. Even while you're eating it, you're going, right. how do I stop my hand from going to my mouth? <laughs> yes, this is yes. really weird. Because yes. it's like someone else is con- in control of my hand right, right now. Right, right. So it's and, a different part of your brain. Yes, yeah. it's the subconscious, which yeah. is the boss. Mm-hmm. And then you, and then at the end, you're, oh, I feel horrible. Why did I do that? And you have all these questions, and you feel like a failure, and then you beat yourself up, and then downward spiral. And you might as well just keep eating more. Exactly. Start over yeah. next week or next month. Right. Or next well, I blew it today, so yeah. I'll start tomorrow. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's it's brain chemistry that's mm-hmm. causing that to happen. Right. Right. Starting from that stupid apple that's the size of a kid's head <laughs> but yeah. if they would have ate, eaten an, an ancient apple right they wouldn't have eaten it because it tasted so bad one. yeah <laughs> yeah i'd be like that tastes terrible why would i eat that yeah right so uh, you said that you've trained your brain to not crave those things so i'm curious what techniques or methods that you use to to train yourself train mm-hmm. your own brain mm-hmm. Well, a lot of the methods that I teach to other people aren't methods that I even use anymore because okay. I don't need them anymore. Right, so right. it's kind of a process, mm-hmm. too. But one of my favorite method, methods is the EFT method. Okay. That's what the tapping... Well, yeah, I had a, I interviewed a lady a few weeks ago that, that mm-hmm. she does that as one of her modalities. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the methods that, that I teach first. Okay. And then uh, I'll teach... Gosh, I've got 30 of them. I've made little videos on them. And I'll, I'll, so if a client comes to me and yeah. they say, I'm struggling, then I, I say, well, I've got a fix for that. Let's try this one. Okay. So I, I send them a link to the YouTube and I explain a little bit. And then let me know if it worked. Okay. Every brain's different. So not everyone's going to work for mm-hmm. every brain. If it didn't, they let me know. And they, all right, try this one. And I just, it only takes two or three to yeah. find which is going to work for them. Right. But then we find one that works. I go, oh, wow, that was weird. I, really worked and even if they're skeptical it still work because it's on it's on a it's usually on a subconscious level skepticism is in the conscious brain and or it's on a chemical level or um, an electrical level like the EFT yeah it's all about electricity and you know energy meridians and stuff like that so I've had plenty of skeptics that have done that technique Mm -hmm. And like this one guy, he's, he's trying to get rid of cookies. We had the cookie there, he made him crave it, and went through all the steps of the EFT. And he's the whole time he's doing the tapping, mm-hmm. he's supposed to be saying cooking craving. And so I'm correcting him because what he's trying to say instead is, this is stupid. Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> he's just annoying the whole time while yeah. he's doing it. Yeah. I go, that's fine, Don. Just keep tapping and just keep trying to crave it. And just coaching him through it. And then we get through. And he looks at the cookie and he goes, huh. He goes, I don't. I don't. I really don't want it. And I go take a bite. He takes it and he goes. Ah, it tastes like cardboard. He goes, wow. But he still didn't want to believe it because right, right. his ego was in the way. He yeah. wanted to be the skeptic. He right, didn't want right. to be wrong. Mm-hmm. And so he says, well, it's just because it's a distraction technique. Mm. And at that point, I didn't want to bother explaining the whole science behind it because he's not going to go for it. Mm-hmm. He's he's a skeptic. He needs he needs to save face. And so I say. That's okay if you think that. And part of it, Don, is that this is distraction technique. Yeah. That's part of it. It's yeah. a very small part of it, but it's yeah. part of it. So I'll let you have that. Yeah. The point is, it worked. So keep doing it and keep building this skill. And he's like, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, I guess it really doesn't matter why. Yeah. It worked. Yeah. So he kept with it and tapped away a whole bunch of other stuff. And that's how I got my start. Is That, that was my main technique. Okay. But like I said... I don't need it anymore because I don't have any right. cravings right. anymore. Okay. The got... chocolate cake that I used to crave, I used to want the corner piece with the extra because it oh my maximizes that was the frosting. Me. That was me too. <laughs> yeah. And if there's some decorations on top of that yeah, corner piece, yeah. that's an extra bonus because yeah. that's even more. It's yeah. like one to one ratio cake to frosting. <laughs> and I was crazy about that kind of stuff. Oh. I couldn't get enough of it. Oh. But now, when I think about that, it, it makes me dry heave because mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. so nasty. Right. Not only do I not want it anymore, it makes me sick to think about mm-hmm. it because of the different brain training techniques that I've done to yeah. rewire my brain. Yeah. So I'm thinking completely different. That's so great. Yeah. 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 And another one is like the seven minute rule. Okay. And that one is really handy for people that find themselves in situations where they could go the wrong way 
And what that that's pretty simple. All you do is you just say, you just look at the food that you're being tempted with and you say, all right, in seven minutes, I will give myself permission to eat that food if I still want to. And then during that seven minutes, now you just remove yourself. Maybe you go, if you're at a restaurant, you go to the bathroom for a couple of those minutes and you think about the goals that mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. for health, hopefully. That's what we try to counsel people. And you go over the reasons why and ask yourself the certain questions that I have outlined. And one of them is, is this, gonna, is this food going to help me live longer or is it going to mm -hmm. kill me faster? Because that's really what it comes down yeah. to. You can, yeah. see, you, can see, you can ask yourself, is this food healthy or not? Yeah. And that's a good question. Right. But sometimes that's not enough leverage for somebody. That is so true, right? Because I can identify with that, I, uh, that, um, that thought process mm -hmm. is that it, you think of it more as like just a pause, right? Like right. this is a break from my healthy journey. So this right. doesn't count and it doesn't matter. But yes. if you really think about it actually is affecting you and it yes. is killing you faster. Yes. That's much more powerful than just like, well, I'll have right. this and get on track this afternoon or tomorrow. Right. Or, right. Right. There's no neutral foods. Right. You're either living longer or you're living shorter or dying earlier. Yeah. And that's, that's the choice. Mm -hmm. So health, yes or no, it's a good question, but maybe it's not strong enough. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will, uh, you know, justify and things like that. But the, is it, is it live, helping me live longer or is it killing me faster? That's a different question. Mm -hmm. It's the same end result, same thing really, but yeah. it's a little bit different. And so then if you answer, this is killing me faster, yeah. then it's more motivation, more leverage. And then if you find yourself justifying mm -hmm. your actions, right. well, maybe, maybe not, you don't really know, and you start yeah. talking I, yourself I, out I, of I it. I hiked a lot today, so... Yes, exactly. So if you find yourself I've been just... Really, I've been really good. <laughs> yeah, I deserve this. Yes, it's a reward. Yeah. <laughs> if you find yourself justifying your actions, it's killing you faster. Okay. And so then the seven minutes, there's certain things and there's more that we go into, but that's the ba basic and some of the things that you think about the, the processes that you go through. And by the time you come back to that food, if you still want it, go ahead and eat it and feel okay about it. Mm -hmm. And don't b beat yourself up over it. Right. And enjoy it. But most likely you're not going to want to eat it. And then you really don't want to eat it. It's not even a willpower thing. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I still want it. It's like, yeah. no, yeah. I don't want it. Well, and there's a big difference. So when you first start talking about giving yourself that seven-minute pause, I'm thinking for most people, they just sit there and fantasize about having it in seven minutes. And that's yeah. a big difference because yeah, right. all that will do is intensify cravings. Bingo. But if you actually work through the mental process that you've presented there, mm -hmm. that's going to be really, really powerful yeah. at getting rid of cravings. Because most people don't want cravings. They just yeah. would prefer them to go away and not have to deal yeah. with them. Right. So that's uh, brilliant. You've given us some really, really good uh, tips and techniques mm -hmm. and strategies. And um, I'm pretty excited about all of this and the, uh, the uh, project we've got coming up. But I want to ask... Um, can you think of, you know, at least one client example of somebody who's just had this amazing transformation, both with your, you know, combining mm -hmm. keto mm -hmm. and your workout technique, your method? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Betty was um, recently just really excited about her results with keto. And every time I counsel somebody on keto, it's really about the commitment level okay. because to go cold turkey keto, mm -hmm. it's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. And that first month can be pretty rough mm -hmm. in how you feel mm -hmm. as your body is converting over from a sugar burner to a fat yeah. burner. Yeah. And just the cravings, the addictions, because they're so strong. They're stronger than drugs. Right, right. And so it's it initially... Even with brain training techniques that make it way easier, it's still a lot of willpower. Mm -hmm. And some people just can't do it. So most people I counsel in steps. Mm -hmm. But Betty to say, hey, yeah, I, I got I can I motivated enough to go cold turkey. So she did. And you know, she went through the whole keto flu and all that kind of stuff and and um, you know, gutted it out and came out the other side. And for her it was just three weeks. And she's like, Oh my god gosh, I feel so amazing. I'm down 20 pounds. In three weeks. Yeah, in yeah. three weeks. Yeah. And on our machine, 
it was water and fat, okay. not muscle, right. which people are really worried about, right, especially right. if they're losing weight fast. Yeah. And oh, that's one of the myths I deal with is people, it can't be healthy if it's fat oh, weight loss. Like if you get your, if you get the biology lined up, your body's going to do however fast weight loss yeah, it wants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, she said, wow, is it possible that I could lose this much fat in three weeks and be eating this much fat, mm -hmm. so much more fat than I used to eat? Right. And I go, that's why. Yeah. And now your body is working like it should work, mm -hmm. like it was designed to work. Mm -hmm. And you've taken out the stuff that on a lifeline, you timeline, you it just introduced yesterday or two minutes ago, yeah. that you have no business eating, that your body can't handle, and now you're giving the stuff it can handle, mm -hmm. that it's designed to eat and process. Now you're getting healthy. Yeah. And this is what happens when people get healthy. Yeah. They get less sick. They get they heal themselves mm -hmm. inside and out. They get lighter, they get leaner energy goes up right. and energy is consistent instead of up and down right right mental clarity mm -hmm. I mean she she's getting more work at uh, more work done at her job mm -hmm. because she's got the level energy right. not the dips yep and she doesn't have to go rush and get the coffee to get out of the dips mm -hmm. and the sugar so she's saving a lot of time and energy mm -hmm. she's able to focus better stay focused instead of ADD that she thought she had, right, guess right. what? It's gone now. Yeah. She never had it. Mm -hmm. It was this thing that right. was causing the problems. Right. Yeah, that's fantastic. And yeah. I can imagine then, too, that she's probably having less sick days at work as well. Oh, gosh, yeah. 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 yeah, that's fantastic. And mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, it sounds like an amazing transformation, but I'm sure you've had the same... Uh, you know, examples of success that I've had is that everybody who does it has an amazing transformation. Yeah. It's, it's not something that, well, you know, give it a shot and then, you know, maybe 5% of the people who follow through might get some improvement. It's mm -hmm. like everybody who does it has an amazing transformation. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm so excited about mm -hmm. doing this work. Yeah. Um, and uh, you've got an added few pieces there that help people make even bigger transformations as mm -hmm. well. So, mm -hmm. well, Thank you so much for being here, yeah. PJ. This has been great. Um, I think everybody probably learned a lot. So if you love this video, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see some more. And uh, that's all we've got for now. Bye. Bye now.